Uh, welcome to the podcast of the European Society of Anesthesiology and uh, Intensive Care. Um, it is a pleasure for me to host this session today. My name is Fabio Guarracino from the University Hospital of Pisa in Italy. Uh, in this video podcast today, we are going to talk about three interesting topics that were presented yesterday during the Best Abstract Prize competition session. And it's really a pleasure for me to have the first finalist, the first presenter, uh, who actually got the first prize, Dr. Paul Garcia. Dr. Paul Garcia is the Division Chief of Neuroanesthesia Unit at the Columbia University Medical Center in New York, United States. And yesterday, Paul talked on intraoperative frontal electroencephalogram substitutes for age in a predictive model of post-anesthesia care unit delirium, a very interesting topic. So, Paul, I, I would like to ask you if you can tell us um, when the idea to study this specific topic came from. How did you think about addressing this specific topic in your research? Thank you, and let me just start by saying thank you for uh, the uh, Best Abstract Prize competition. Thank you for putting on such a wonderful conference, and it's really an honor to be here. Um, the motivation for this study came from a previous study that we had done that was published in 2019, where we uh, collected data from nearly 700 patients undergoing surgery and determined that certain EEG patterns were associated with delirium in the recovery room, also called the post-anesthesia care unit or the PACU. During that study, we um, thought that we might be able to use the data retrospectively to make a predictive model for delirium. And that's where the inspiration came from to do this in a retrospective way from data that was already collected. That's very interesting. And um, I have another question for you that came up in my mind yesterday while listening to your presentation, to your very interesting presentation. Um, how did you set up the predictive model? And uh, did you need support from experts with specific skills maybe? Um, we set up the model with um, most, of the, most of us in my research group have been learning statistics along the way. Um, we uh, all have improved our stati statistical knowledge over the past 10 years um, through this study and several others. We did not employ any specific statistician. Um, however, uh, we did have a, a master's degree student in statistics um, that was working on it and one of the co-authors um, was uh, also still studying for a further advanced degree in statistics and they were very helpful as we set up this this model which is although multivariable linear regression is not a brand new concept in statistics um, doing 1000 iterations of uh, training and uh, testing by sorting the data um, randomly is becoming more popular amongst uh, statistical testing models. So is the aka -Ike information criteria, which is one of the ways that we can kind of grade the information content in one model versus another. So these are relatively newer statistical concepts that we um, used in our in our model for the for this project. This is very encouraging, I think, for the the anesthesia community because it means that this approach can be spread and probably very useful in, in many places. Um, do you expect that the artificial intelligence stepping into our fields will help you with developing these predictive models? Yeah, I, I actually do, Fabio. I think that um, machine learning algorithms, um, of which I've, I've just barely started to um, investigate for these large databases that my group has gathered, I think that they can be very useful. The important thing is, is that we have to add our 
clinical intuition and make sure that the clinical context to which the data is considered um, is uh, paramount and, and really an important piece of this. I don't think that it's very helpful to simply look at associations of um, one number to another number or from, um, because if you simply look at the mathematical associations without any kind of clinical context, it, I'm concerned that it may steer you wrong. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think it's, uh, yeah. And now, Paul, I would really like you to tell us and our colleagues, how will your research proceed from now on? What will be the next steps? What you expect to happen with your research? That's great. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate to have so many work with so many great people from New Zealand and Germany and um, of course that my my colleagues in the United States and um, sometimes I feel like we almost have too many ideas and too many projects that we're working on at the same time um, but the follow-up on um, this study is to make a um, randomized cl clinical trial where we can start to use the uh, intraoperative decision making that we that all anesthesiologists do regarding hypnotic drugs, um, drugs that control um, analgesia, and uh, drugs that control physiologic variables, in order to influence um, the patient to move into these uh, EEG patterns that are seem to be protective against delirium, to see if we can actually. Um, take somebody that might have been at a higher risk of developing delirium and lower the risk through intraoperative pharmacologic decision making. Paul, I really thank you very much for being with us today and a, a special thank to you for your work in our field and for accepting our invitation to, the, the, to this video podcast. Uh, Fabio, Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here and I look forward to coming back to the ESA because I, I have really enjoyed my time here, not just in, in Glasgow and, and we'll definitely be going to Munich for next year. See you next year then. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Lada Liovic from uh, Croatia. Um, Lada yesterday presented a very interesting study on analyzing big data. Uh, how could the ROCS index predict risk for intubation in a surgical patient receiving a non-invasive ventilation or CPAP? Uh, Lada ran this study uh, at the Amsterdam USC Department of Intensive Care in the Netherlands in collaboration with Sisters of Charity from Zagreb, Croatia. So Lada, I very much appreciated your study. It was very interesting to listen to you yesterday. And my first question is, can you tell us what inspired you for this work? How did you think about assessing the ROX index in this specific setting? Actually, I was very surprised to hear last year at this very Congress that uh, the ROX index was, wasn't verified for use with uh, CPAP mask. Nobody, nobody did this research. So I was already looking for a project to use big data with classical statistics because I was a bit frustrated that all the people who work with big data kind of forgot that you can use the same data to use to create classical statistical projects, right? They all use it for artificial intelligence and that makes kind of big data a lot distant to a typical clinician, right? So I wanted classical statistics project and I wanted something that's readily clinically useful. So that's how the idea came. That's very interesting. and. In the times we are living, it seems that this approach is gaining more and more importance you know, in, in, in our research. Um, can you tell us what you consider the most relevant, important findings of this study? I think that the most relevant, important finding is not the fact that uh, ROX index can differentiate probable successful uh, therapy after four hours, it's that it doesn't mean anything in the first two hours or in the first four hours. So if we all calculate these indices in the first four hours, it doesn't mean 
that we are going to fail our therapy or succeed with our therapy. And most of the patients that are on uh, non-invasive uh, ventilation, they do not, um, they're not ventilated long enough to see the impact, right? We all keep these patients for two or four hours, while after several hours, they might actually succeed. So that's um, actually what's surprising. Very interesting. And was there any result, if any, that actually disappointed you? That, that you did not expect to... I did not expect to see so many patients with high ROX index that had high ROX index that were actually ventilated. It seemed to me that uh, clinicians tend to use it sometimes for post-operative maybe support to breathing where they don't really need it in the initial phase. So that's what's what surprised me the most. That's what disappointed me. That's very interesting. So, so you see a potential um, for a clinical application of big data in this specific setting, I mean. Definitely. And you see an, a possible application in, in the short term? Yes, of course. It's um, We use retrospective data that um, instantly, in two weeks, verified what we thought or was going to be verified without running a prospective study, because prospective study would have taken two years to, to sure. gather this yeah. ma these many patients. So if you get this kind of result that uh, with 80% certainty, you get to see what will happen with these patients in the next 24 hours, that's what we wanted, then I guess I'm very satisfied with your result. So, and now I'm very curious to ask you, what are your next steps with this study, with this approach? Well, I think that uh, we did this study on one population, that's European population, and European population and uh, in the ICUs and the population of patients in, uh, for example, USA, are very different uh, regarding severity, regarding the type of patients that are admitted to the ICU. So I intend to uh, run the same uh, the same methods on USA based uh, database mm -hmm. that's mimic the database or maybe some of the Japanese or the other available databases that there are I already did some work on mimic so the results are going to be interesting so you still have a lot of work to do very soon <laughs> yeah but yeah. considering the the advance the advancement of um, ChatGPT and stuff. But now the programming goes a lot faster, so I want, to, I want to motivate people to do, to use these tools, to work on these databases. They don't need to know machine learning. They don't need to know artificial intelligence. They can just sit down, ask ChatGPT to write them a piece of code that will extract the patients they want and have their idea checked on a very large set of patients. Very good. Lada, I would very much like to thank you for your decision to to present your research data in this meeting and I would like to congratulate you for your second prize thank for this interesting much. research. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure for me now to um, introduce Dr. Simon Kangerbauer from Germany. Um, she ran a very interesting study and presented the data yesterday on the evaluation of a software system for guideline-based pre-medication in anesthesia, a study that was run uh, at the Technical University of Munich, Department of Anesthesiology of Intensive Care, in collaboration with the University Hospital of Ulm in Germany. So, um, I would be very interested, um, Simone, to know from you um, when this idea came came up in your mind to apply a software to help the anesthesiology in the pre-operative pre evaluation. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to be invited. Um, the idea came actually from my uh, present boss, <laughs> Professor Bettina Jungwirth uh, um, in Ulm. She was um, the leader of our pre-operative assessment clinic in Munich at the time and um, she always felt that um, the visits were not extensive enough and 
uh, that guideline adherence was really bad. So um, we searched the literature and <laughs> indeed uh, there were publications about guideline implementation and adherence in Germany, published in German journals, because the authors were ashamed of the results, perhaps. <laughs> um, and well, guideline adherence in Germany is about 50% overall. And uh, we thought this needs improvement and we have an electronic patient data management system um, for the whole anesthetic process. So from the preoperative assessment, intraoperative uh, data and postoperative in the recovery room. So we thought it was a, a good chance to implement a guideline based decision tool. That's really very, uh, really very interesting. Uh, as I said also yesterday. Um, can you <coughs> summarize for us the main findings of your study so um, that our colleagues, when they will listen to you, <laughs> will have an idea of what is important from your study? Uh, well, guideline adherence needs improvement. Uh, it's not so bad when we take the clinical context into account because uh, in our patient collective, we had many tumor patients, palliative patients, where it was uh, a decision for the individual patient, so um, it was not that bad. But um, nevertheless, um, it needs improvement, especially uh, for cardiac and pulmonary function tests. And we do a lot of unnecessary uh, evaluations, especially uh, laboratory tests, which are very expensive and cause unnecessary costs. Uh, that's very interesting, especially in the light of the, um, the recent guidelines, which, as you said, we are going to incorporate in your uh, in your system. Um, so your your data, Simon, highlight a gap between guidelines and real work. Do you think that a software incorporating the guideline could improve the adherence, or you just think that such an approach is only of supporting the decision making? Will this improve the adherence to the guidelines? Yes, I think so. Um, in, in Germany, uh, the preoperative assessment is often done by very young colleagues. And I think many of them are not really aware of the guideline recommendations and it will uh, be good for them to, to see it visually during the evaluation process. Yeah, that's a very good point. Well, we have the same experience also in, um, in my hospital. With the, the, usually it's the younger, the junior colleagues doing that. And I agree with you that such systems can be very supportive. And what will be your next steps? What are you going to do next with your research? Is <laughs> there any new uh, step you are going to take? Yes, there's a lot of work because um, we have new guidelines from the ESC uh, released last year. and. We are currently updating um, the recommendations um, in respect to biomarkers especially, which will be a great challenge uh, to deal with our surgeons. <laughs> and um, we are working on a web application um, for patients uh, so that they can um, fill in the assessment form themselves at home and get uh, told which uh, examinations they need. And um, so the preoperative assessment can be started at home and will be then finished by the physician in the hospital. Well, that's a very interesting point because this can really change the, the current approach to the preoperative evaluation and improve the approach and optimize the resources that you, as you were addressing previously. So, Simon, I, I would really like to thank you so much for accepting the invitation to join this ESAIC video podcast. And let me congratulate for your research data and for your third prize for your abstract. Thank you so much. So, I thank everyone uh, for listening to this episode of ESAIC uh, video podcast. You know, our society, ESAIC, uh, releases monthly podcasts on the website and, and other various streaming platform. And we hope you will join us for the next one. And we look forward to meeting you next year in Munich.